Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silence so that they don't affect the committee's work today? Item 1, decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take items 4, 5 and 6 in private this morning? Thank you. Item two is the 2016-17 audit of NHS Tayside. I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses today, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Fiona Mitchell-Knight, Assistant Director of Audit, Claire Sweeney, Associate Director, and Bruce Crosby, Senior Audit Manager from Audit Scotland. I'm going to invite Colin Beattie to open, open questions for the committee. Um, Auditor General, in the past, I've raised the question of the uh, capability of internal audit and the appropriate, appropriateness of it in its present form. Here we seem to have another problem with internal audit, and we've got a history of this. We've had NHS Grampian, NHS 24, we've got NHS Tayside, we had Coatbridge College, we had Edinburgh College, where there seem to be, where they seem to do their job, but they don't pick up what's necessary. Is there a problem here? I think in this case, Mr Beattie, it's premature to conclude that the problem is with internal audit. Um, the evidence that's available to us so far, and clearly the investigation is still underway, is that internal audit um, did raise concerns about the retrospective transaction on the endowment fund, which is, I assume, what you're referring to. Um, that that uh, concern wasn't acted on by the trustees of the fund at the time. Um, we know that the Scottish Government um, has uh, asked Grant Thornton to continue its investigative work to look at this particular transaction following on from the work on e-health funds that you took evidence on before the Easter break. Um, and I prefer not to comment on the role of internal audit until then. I think it's clear, though, that there was a breakdown in the governance more generally. Um, and I'm looking to see what advice the trustees took before taking their decision um, about the use of endowment funds back in 2014 before I draw any conclusions about that. It's clearly not just a question of the endowment funds. Uh, the, this question of the e-health funds raises questions about internal audit. For example, Leslie McClay, when she appeared as a witness, said that she wasn't aware that the e-health funds were within the deferred expenditure. And she hadn't asked because there was never any risk identified to her or the board. And she went on to say that she relies, or, or we, as she said, we rely on internal audit to review our allocations, and there was never any risk identified that there were inappropriate allocations coming into our board. Was her expectation reasonable? Should she, should she have expected internal audit to be able to alert the board? Her, her expectation was clearly reasonable. Um, the reason that I'm um, pausing before drawing the same conclusion that you are is because the Grant Thornton review was very clear that the allocation letters, um, which go from the Scottish Government to each health board with the allocations, didn't make it clear that these funds were either ring, funds, ring fenced for e health purposes or were repayable in the following year. Um, without that clarity, I think it's difficult to see how internal audit could have raised it as a risk. Um, or how the board members could have known. The Grant Thornton report makes it clear that the former Director of Finance was aware of it, and equally that the Director of Finance within NSS, which arranged for the allocation changes to go through, um, but that the uh, conditions around that allocation for e-health monies weren't clear on the allocation letters, which would be the basis that internal audit would look at, as well as the basis for external audit to um, make sure that the revenue recognition was accurate in the annual audit of the financial statements. Are you aware whether internal audit actually uh, reviewed the contents of how this account, de deferred expenditure account, was made up, what the component parts were? I'll ask Fiona and Bruce to pick that up, if I may. Oh, right. oh, okay. So, um, so um, from an external audit perspective, there are, there are two issues with the deferred expenditure. There's about the accounting and the financial sustainability angles. Um, from the perspective of the accounting, the deferred expenditure is included in the um, board's income in an appropriate way and in compliance with the accounting rules. And we're satisfied that that was the case in 2016-17, the period that, that we've carried out the audit. 
Um, the bigger issue is about what that means for the financial sustainability of the board um, in that they're relying on non-recurring funds and both us and internal audit have reported on the risks that that brings to the board, their reliance on non-recurring funds. And indeed, that was included in, in um, the Auditor General's report to you that was discussed in, in October about those risks. Just turning to the endowment question, do the uh, internal auditors receive copies of the board minutes? The board minutes or the fund minutes? Either. The board minutes, certainly. The fund minutes, I would assume so, but I think Bruce will be able to confirm that for you. Yes, as I understand, they do receive the, the, the minutes from the, the fund as well. So the internal, internal auditors would have received the minutes of the meetings which, in which this was discussed and in which the action was taken that we're now aware of. Would they, would they not reasonably have read this and said, this is a problem? Internal audits, internal audits just raised their concerns about the retrospective transaction back in 2014, um, and it is included in the external auditors' report as well, both in the body of the report and in the executive summary. Um, so this has been in the public domain for some time. Um, the question which I think is now uh, um, of concern to us is the advice which the trustees of the fund took um, before making, before approving the transaction that they did. But there was disclosure in the uh, annual audit report um, and as a result I think of the internal auditors um, uh, involvement in the governance statement of the board's annual report itself. I'm just struggling a bit with the concept that all this has been in the public area, the public arena and nobody's really picked it up. You say the internal auditors raised it, raised it as an issue, presumably they raised it to the board, the board that itself actually was part of the problem, if you like. How does this work? I think it's a very good question, Mr Beatty. As you say, um, this was raised in 2014 by internal audit and by external audit. Um, I have reported on the financial pressures and the financial sustainability of NHS Tayside to this committee um, each year for the last three years on 14, 15, 15, 16 and 16, 17. Um, in my annual overview reports, I've been uh, highlighting the, um, the, the perverse incentives, the uh, very narrow focus um, which health boards are taking to land on their revenue resource limits each year rather than their broader sustainability. Um, so there is, I think, a significant question about why throughout the NHS system warnings from auditors are not being taken seriously. Um, but the, the reason why is something I, that I think you would need to ask of people in Scottish Government and in the board itself. Now, the external auditors presumably look at all the reports and so on from internal audit. They work closely together. The external auditors, what did they do when they saw this, when they saw this transaction? I think it's important, first of all, for me to be clear that the um, external auditors don't audit the endowment fund. The endowment fund appoints its own auditors, um, and they're not within my remit as Auditor General. Of course. Point. Um, there was evidence from internal audit of a concern. Yeah. The external auditor surely would have picked that up yep. and developed it. They did. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm starting off by clarifying what the formal responsibilities are. So I appoint an auditor to the board. Um, the endowment fund appoints its own auditors. Since 2014, the accounts of the endowment fund have been consolidated within the accounts of the NHS board um, because, of the ex because of the degree of overlap between them in lay terms. Um, you are probably aware that the uh, trustees of the endowment fund are the members of the health board appointed by the cabinet secretary sitting in a different capacity, but they're the same people sitting with different roles. So um, the... Auditor of the Health Board, in order to carry out that consolidation, issues a questionnaire and instructions to the Auditor of the Fund, um, which asks them for a number of um, pieces of information 
about uh, the board minutes, the significant transactions that were taken, any unusual transactions, and as a result of that, included in their annual report for 2014 um, a very clear statement about the retrospective transaction and the extent to which the board had relied on transfers from the endowment fund during 2014 in order to balance its books. That was the first year in recent times that NHS Tayside has required um, brokerage, and this was part of the same picture. But because they're not the auditor of the endowment fund, um, the, it's not their responsibility, and indeed they have no locus, to look at the advice which the um, endowment fund took before approving that transaction. <coughs> That's a matter for the um, auditors of the endowment fund and indeed the trustees of the fund who've got very specific responsibilities under the charities regulations for acting in the best interests of the fund. And I understand that's what the review that Oscar are currently carrying out will be exploring. I realise that uh, obviously um, the endowment fund itself doesn't fall within the, the audit programme. But I would say again, internal audit raised it. You say external audit picked that up and took action on it. But here we are, some years later, and the problem just seems to have popped out. And yet, supposedly, it's been in the, in the public, uh, public uh, arena for some years. There's no supposedly about it. I've got the annual audit report here. It's been on our website and NHS Tayside's website since June of 2014. Um, and it's very clearly reported in there. Um, I think the, um, the issue that has arisen now is whether the board was, board was acting properly as uh, trustees of the endowment fund in approving that, the advice which they took, um, and whether they were aware of the concerns which I understand the internal audit had raised at that point. It, as, as far as I know at this point, there is no concern that the transfer was illegal. It was a regular transaction, and the auditor reported it in that way as being something which is an unusual usual transaction which played into the growing picture of financial pressures at NHS Tayside. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that everybody claims they did their job, and yet we are where we are. I mean, is the audit, is the audit function broken? Is, do we, should we be investigating whether the way that we handle internal audit, and maybe even aspects of external audit, should that be reviewed? You won't be surprised to hear my view that this isn't about the effectiveness of audit. This is reported within the external audit report. Um, it, the concerns were raised by internal audit. The question is why the trustees of the endowment fund didn't respond to those concerns um, when they were reported. I think that is what Oscar are looking at. And for me, it raises a question about whether there is an inherent conflict of interest um, in the fact that the trustees of the endowment fund are the same people as the members of the NHS board. That's a question that was considered by the Scottish Government back in 2013 when it produced its guidance for endowment funds. They concluded that there was no inherent uh, conflict of interest. Um, I think that question is now back in play, given what we have seen um, in Tayside, the concerns that are being raised, um, and the uh, question of whether, particularly in times when health boards are under financial pressure, uh, trustees are able to separate their responsibilities as trustees from those as members of the health board. And I think that's a fair question that hopefully Oscar will bring out in the report. But at the beginning of, the, uh, at the beginning of my questions, I gave a, a list of failures, of what, what I certainly see as failures in the audit system, where problems arose that audit did not pick up, either because it was not within their process or whatever. I mean, is audit a chocolate fire guard here? Not at all. I think, it's, I think it is important to, to be clear what audit does. Um, audit doesn't substitute for the responsibilities of management and board members charged with governance in making sure that they have got proper checks and balances in place, that they follow the co corporate governance requirements, um, that they comply with the Nolan principles. Um, it does um, provide a way of, for external audit, reviewing the extent to which those checks and balances are being applied and reporting that to the appropriate body, and in the case of the bodies in my remit, it's this committee, which is why we've been discussing them. Um, auditors don't have stop powers. They can't stop people from doing things that they think um, are inappropriate. The power that we have is the power of public transparency and exposure. Um, and I think the fact that we're discussing these things um, is a marker of the system working, not of it being broken. 
just one last question. Are you, are you satisfied that given the scale of the financial issues that we're facing NHS Tayside, are you satisfied that no undue pressure was put on, or, on the internal audit at any point to go easy on any of their uh, audit processes? I, I can't give you that assurance. Um, I know internal audit raised some concerns. Um, I know that in the case of the endowment um, fund transaction, those concerns weren't listened to. Um, I don't know what pressure may have been applied, but I think it's an, a worthwhile question to ask. Thank you. Auditor General, to follow up on uh, Colin Beattie's line of questioning, um, the day this issue about the endowment funds came to light, it was a story in uh, The Herald written by Helen McCardle, and she said, internal auditors from NHS Fife and Forth Valley questioned how endowment fund cash was being used, but were warned they risked losing their contract with NHS Tayside unless they backed off. What is your reaction to that? I've seen the press coverage as well. Um, it obviously uh, informs my response to Mr Beattie's question. Um, I, I don't have evidence either way of whether they were put under pressure or not. Um, I expect that's one of the issues that the second phase of the Grant Thornton Review will, ex will explore. Um, and I think it's worth noting that it is one of the differences between internal and external audit, certainly in the Scottish public audit system. Um, internal auditors are either appointed by or a part of the body that they provide services to. External auditors are appointed by me to bodies in the health service and the other bodies that I um, have responsibility for. And that means that that sort of pressure can't be applied um, in the external audit world in the same way that it potentially could be in internal audit. I think that's an important distinction. If, if that were true, what I read out, I take it you would see that as unacceptable. Completely. Yeah. Internal audit is there to provide assurance to those charged with governance. Um, it's intended to have a degree of independence to report directly to the audit committee, not simply through the chief executive. Um, and while there's always a discussion about the, fact, the factual accuracy of an issue, um, at the end of the day, it's for the auditor, internal or external, to make their judgment and to report it without fear or favour. I'd like to follow up on um, some of Mr Beattie's other questioning. In your opinion, the trustees of the endowment fund at NHS Tayside, did they comply with the Nolan principles at that meeting in 2014 when they suspended the constitution? I, I think it's premature to conclude that they didn't. Um, I know there's been a lot of um, concern raised publicly about the fact that the um, funds were spent on a computer system. Actually, if you step back and look at the purposes and charitable objectives of all of the endowment funds, they are quite broadly drawn. Um, they're about... Um, uh, providing support for health services, and they're very close to the objectives of the NHS in the same legislation, the NHS Scotland Act 1978. The guidance that was produced in 2013 by the Scottish Government um, adds a proviso which says that trustees should be careful they're not substituting for core health services, and clearly that comes into play in um, what we currently know about the retrospective expenditure on um, IT systems. And I think the other concern that I've got is that it was retrospective rather than being part of a planned programme of expenditure of endowment fund monies. Um, the review which Oscar are carrying out will look at uh, whether, for example, the trustees took their own legal advice separate from that of the board about the use of funds for this purpose and the question that we've just been exploring about whether they took advice from their internal auditors um, in the way that I would expect them to do. That Oscar uh, report, I don't think any of us are all that clear of when we expect it to report. Do you know when it's expected to report? We have a letter here from David Robb, and I'll ask one of my colleagues to check um, if that contains a date. I think it probably does not have an explicit target date in there. Um, the that the committee has, I don't think it does, but maybe we can check that after. Sure. On the Endowment Fund trustees, you said um, it's an open question now of whether the Endowment Fund trustees should be the same people as board members who are under pressure to, um, to reduce a deficit or, or, or to balance the books. In your opinion, as Auditor General, should there now be a separation between <laughs> Endowment Fund trustees and board members on health boards? I think that is um, a matter for Oscar and for the government, um, but my view is that this case shows the risks of having uh, the two sets of individuals working in two uh, separate capacities at the same time. Um, 
and I, th I think in theory it's easy to agree with the conclusion reached in the government's 2013 guidance that with proper processes there need be no conflict. Um, but I think when we are in a situation where all boards are under significant financial pressure, um, it's difficult to maintain that separation in practice. Do you think that 2013 guidance is good enough? Um, some trustees tell me that presented with these decisions on whether this is charitable spending or core funding, sometimes it's very uh, difficult to make that call. Do you think the 2013 guidance is strong enough? I, I would completely agree with trustees that it is hard to make that call. Um, I've said that the charitable purpose and objectives of end endowment funds are in many ways exactly the same as those of the NHS. Um, so it's not the case that endowment funds are only there for the extras or for patient comforts or um, the, the sorts of things that, that um, people might assume that they're there for. Um, it's very common, for example, uh, for people to make a donation for a specific piece of medical equipment. In the past, we've seen them funding things like MRI scans. So it, it's, not a, it's not an easy separation to make, um, but I suspect that's another reason why it might be worth reconsidering whether the trustees should be um, different people from the board members or at least have an independent um, element um, within the makeup of the, the, the board of trustees of the fund. Auditor General, I understand from the press coverage that there, were, there was, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, 4.3 million transferred from the endowment fund to... Um, NHS core funding, but 2.71 million was spent. Now, the Cabinet Secretary um, and the, the new chair of NHS Tayside have said that the endowment funds will be paid back. How much money would you expect to be paid back? Is it the 4.3 million that has been transferred or the 2.71 million that was spent? Um, the amount in 2014 that was funded retrospectively on projects that Tayside um, Health Board had commenced was the 2.7 million. Um, during the year, um, the, uh, the amount transferred was larger, and I don't know how much of that was spent or not. I think it's worth being clear, though, that um, we've been following closely events in Tayside, including the board meeting last week, which agreed to repay the um, the money to the endowment fund um, and Fiona as the auditor of the board um, has asked them for a range of information um, including the legal advice they've taken about their ability to make that transfer from health service funding into the endowment fund um, the specific statutes that they're relying on um, and the process things like the the paper that the board considered and the minute they've taken so we're still considering um, how that transaction can be made in a way that fits with the board's own powers and responsibilities. I'm just not 100% clear because if the 4.3 million has been taken from the charitable fund and put into NHS core funding, people that have raised this money and given so generously would probably expect the 4.3 million to be returned and not just that that had been spent. Is that what you're saying should be transferred back? That's why we're looking to see the board paper which was considered and the legal advice which the board took in considering that. At the moment, we don't know that. Um, Fiona and Bruce weren't at the board meeting last week. We haven't yet seen the board agenda paper and the minute which explored um, the, uh, what would be the proper course of action for the board members to take at this stage. OK, that's something we can come back to. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, we looked last week in some detail at the undetected e-health funds. So this was 5.3 million that was uh, obscured, uh, to use Paul Gray's language, in the accounts. Uh, last, uh, last time we looked at, Leslie McClay stated that she wasn't aware of it. Uh, the former chair, Professor Connell, said that the 5.3 million had been broken down into chunks that were almost de minimis, so they wouldn't be picked up. So the question is, would you have expected to see a higher level of scrutiny by either the management team or the board in those circumstances? I think um, I would expect two things that don't seem to have happened here. One, the allocation letters that went from the Scottish Government to the Health Board to be clear about the purpose of the funds that were being transferred and any conditions attached to them, including um, whether they were intended for the benefit of uh, boards other than simply Tayside and whether they were um, due to be repaid in the following financial year, both of which seem not to have happened. Um, and I would expect the Director of Finance, who holds a very significant and responsible position 
position um, within the corporate governance of the board um, to be making that clear to the management team and to the board as part of the financial reporting. Neither of those seem to have happened on the basis of the report that Grant Thornton have produced so far. We'll come back to the Director of Finance shortly, if I may, but uh, before that, should we heard quite a lot of evidence uh, around how difficult it might be to pick up uh, the, these funds within the accounts. So uh, can you just make clear, should the management team and the board have detected those funds? Is it, is it possible for a board to do? Is it possible for a management team to do? I think it would have been hard to do given the... Um the lack of detail, the lack of information included in the allocation letters. I'll perhaps ask um, Fiona and Bruce to tell you more about what, what they see as they carry out the audit, given that revenue recognition is one of the significant risks that any auditor has to look at as part of their work. Fiona. Yes. Um, so the accounting rules um, on income for boards say that the income that's included in the board's accounts should agree to that that is seen in the Scottish Government funding allocation letters. So those funding allocation letters are our prime source of evidence for looking at what income should be included in the accounts. And for the audit of 1617, we checked those letters into the accounts. And indeed, the letters do not say anything about any of the funds not belonging to Tayside, nor do they mention any requirement for them to be repaid. So there was no way that we could identify from the letters that that was the case, um, nor could we expect other members of, of the board um, management team to, to identify it either from, from those specific letters. And we, of course, were not aware of the discussions that were ongoing behind the scenes between the directors of finance um, and the health group, um, which is discussed in the Grant Thornton. We hadn't seen any of those emails or any other evidence w which would lead us to question anything that was shown in those allocation letters. Are the allocation letters, uh, w was this an unusual drafting, if you like, of the allocation letters, or is this a structural failing that needs to be rectified? Structural failing. Um, I've reported in my annual overview reports across the NHS uh, since 2012 when I took up this job um, that because of the narrow focus that boards have on hitting their financial targets on the 31st of March, there is an awful lot of changes to the allocations that board get, boards get during the year and indeed after the end of the financial year um, for different purposes. Um, so there, there's an underlying concern there that it's not easy for a board to know how much they've got to spend potentially in until after the financial year end. In this particular case, um, we know from the Grant Thornton report um, that it suited both NSS and NHS Tayside for allocations to be moving in this way. The directors of finance of both bodies appear to have been aware of that um, because it removed a surplus from uh, NSS uh, National Services Scotland uh, to NHS Tayside, which helped to reduce the deficit that NHS Tayside had. But because of shortcomings in the way that the allocations were managed, that wasn't apparent to anybody else except uh, the directors of finance in those organisations and uh, potentially a small number of their more junior uh, team members. Would a, uh, would a differently constituted board potentially have picked this up? Let's say, for example, uh, my understanding is the board of NHS Grampian seemed to be performing rather well, uh, hence one of the reasons why we've uh, got some changes going on at NHS Tayside. Uh, might their board have picked this sort of thing up? Would a high-performing board have picked this up? As Fiona has said, I think it would be very difficult for any board to do it if they were being misled by their Director of Finance. The Director of Finance holds a very significant responsibility. They have professional and ethic responsibilities um, by merit of being members of their professional accounting bodies. Um, they have personal responsibilities in relation to the Corporate Governance Code and the Financial Reporting Manual. And I think if they're not making that information available to, to board members or to management team members, it's difficult to see how the, um, the board can be expected to overcome that. The uh, the Director of Finance, uh, I'm going to recite the narrative that I'm hearing at this side and, and that I heard last week. Uh, Auditor General, you've just talked about being misled, or the board was misled by Director of Finance, and 
Uh, Paul Gray uh, talked about deliberate obscuring. The narrative I'm getting, and the thing that doesn't quite make sense, is the then director of finance was long-serving. Uh, I think he'd been there for about 35 years. Uh, he was very senior, very experienced, very close to retirement, uh, and yet, without referral to his colleagues, including a CEO and former CEO, uh, whom he'd worked with for a long time, he apparently deliberately obscures uh, this transaction, uh, a process for which he derives no financial benefit himself, a process which delivers no benefit to NHS Tayside, because we heard from Paul Gray that brokerage would have been extended and there wouldn't have been a problem with that, so nothing is apparently achieved. Uh, and that's the... Effectively, the, the FD goes rogue for no reason. Uh, is that credible? I, I can't clearly speak for the um, motives, the rationale for the Director of Finance's behaviour. Um, and indeed, all I can go on is what's in the public domain, um, both in relation to the e-health monies over the last few weeks, um, but also going back to 2013-14, um, when auditors first started, in the time that I've been in the role here, raising significant concerns about the financial pressure that Tayside was in. Um, I think Tayside first received brokerage in 2013-14. That's not terribly unusual. A number of boards require brokerage from time to time. But since 2013-14, Tayside has received brokerage every year and needed it, um, and has been resorting um, more than most boards to short-term measures to bring its budget into balance at the end of each financial year. Um, I think it's important to be clear, as I've said in my um, overview reports every year since I've been in this job, that NHS boards take that responsibility very seriously, the, the need to balance their budget um, almost to the penny at the end of March each year, and that, in my opinion, that gets in the way of um, more strategic, more important, longer-term financial planning um, that would help to address the underlying causes of some of these pressures. Um, but I think it's that climate um, which may help to explain the actions of the Director of Finance rather than any sense of personal gain. Um, I think it is the, 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 the premium, the focus that's placed um, by the Scottish Government and more generally in the public debate about health boards balancing their books rather than having a sustainable financial strategy for the longer term. I appreciate it's a difficult question to answer, um, but is it credible that the Director of Finance did all of this and didn't at any stage say to anyone else in the organisation, this is what I'm doing to achieve the end game that, that we require. Do you think that's credible? That, that's a very broad question. Um, and again, it's difficult for me to comment on uh, people's motivations or what may have been known. Um, what we what we do know, um, for example, around the e-health funds is that, um, that they, it would have been very hard for members of the management team or the board to have been aware of what was going on. Um, auditors do see revenue recognition as being one of the key risks that they plan their audit work around each year, and they look for evidence to make sure um, that the, uh, the, the income is properly stated in the accounts. Um, and individual auditors and I at a national level have been reporting for five years now about the measures that people take right across Scotland to balance their books in terms of deferring expenditure, of making uh, non-recurring savings, um, and from the Scottish Government's point of view of uh, redistributing money through late allocations to um, bring boards into balance. All of that um, means that I think it is possible um, that the way in which a relatively small, small amount of money, and let's not forget that in 2016-17 the amount of e-health funding involved was 2.6 million, that that may not have been apparent to more senior people in the organisation. I don't know whether people who were more junior within the finance team knew about it, but I suspect they may not have understood the significance of it or have had the whole picture to see it in that way. General, you've referred to the behaviour of the former director of finance. Do you have any evidence 
that he did not share this information about the e-health e deferred funds? Do you have any evidence apart from what we heard from Paul Gray and Leslie McClay at the last committee meeting? The evidence that I'm founding on is the report that was commissioned from Grant Thornton to explore the specific issue of e-health funding, where they reached that conclusion very explicitly in their report. The conclusion that the Director of Finance had not shared this information? I think the way they phrase it was that it would have been very difficult to see how other members of the board could have been aware of it. Okay. Um, but the report, again, is available to the committee. Ian Gray. <coughs> Clearly, there, there's a concern, or the committee has a concern to try and get at whether this is a problem with the behaviour of particular individuals in NHS side or particular elements of governance, internal <laughs> audit, the audit committee, um, or the finance director, as Mr Kerr was asking? Or is it a problem to do with NHS side, or is it a problem to do with the wider um, NHS system? Um, I think, is, uh, is it fair to say, Auditor General, that what, what you suggested in your previous answer uh, was that what happened here was not an attempt a personal gain by anybody, but perhaps an act of desperation to look as if a budget had been balanced, which it was impossible, in fact, to balance. Is that, is that reasonable? Yes, I'm very clear that there's no question of personal gain in this. Um, I think it's difficult to understand it without understanding the context um, of uh, general pressure and concern to deliver a balanced budget within each uh, health ward across Scotland. Um, and a situation which had been building since at least 2013-14 of that being increasingly difficult to do. Set that alongside what we now know are shortcomings in the process by which the Scottish Government um, allocates resources to individual boards. Um, my sense is, informed by the Grant Thornton report, that the Director of Finance at NHS Tayside was able to use that to make the position appear better than it was. So you said again there, as, as you have previously, you talk, sorry, you talked there again Auditor General, about measures to balance the books in order to meet the short-term requirement to balance the funds across boards across Scotland. So those pressures, which perhaps we can surmise have, have led to the behaviour uh, in NHS Tayside, are prevalent in other boards across Scotland. That's true. I've been reporting since I took this job that although um, I think in 2012-13, in which was the first year for which I had responsibility, um, almost no boards, I, I won't say none, um, failed to meet their resource limit targets, that was done at the cost of an awful lot of short-term measures like deferring expenditure, like late allocations, like finding non-recurring savings, which gave the appearance of a balanced budget but actually didn't address the underlying problems. And in response to Mr Beattie earlier, you said, throughout the system, auditors' warnings are not being taken seriously. So throughout the system, you meant across the NHS, across Scotland. Um, I, when I said that, I meant two things specifically. I meant in, in NHS Tayside, um, these warnings have been sounded um, since 2013-14 uh, very clearly. And in relation to the system as a whole, I've been saying this since uh, I took it up the role in 2012 about the pressures on the NHS beyond that. Um, the, the overview reports contain information about the measures being taken at other boards, but I'd prefer not to be specific about those without referring back to the factual content of the reports. So is it fair to say that NHS Tayside is the canary in the coal mine? This is the place where these pressures have led to the problems that we've seen and are now dealing with, and which the Health Secretary has had to deal with by using her um, special powers. I don't Is this an indication of problems which potentially could arise elsewhere? I don't think it's straightforward to draw that direct um, line of conclusion between the two. Um, we know that there are some particular uh, circumstances in Tayside which have made the pressures more acute on them, um, and the committee has taken evidence on that, that on a number of occasions over the last couple of years um, to do with their expenditure on drugs, on agency staff, on the property portfolio that they hold. Um, but equally, I have reported over the last five years um, on the extent to which most boards are relying on short term measures to balance their books. Alex Neil. Can I begin? There are 
the, the issue of the e health money and the endowment funds um, are two separate issues, clearly, and two separate sets of circumstances. So starting off with the e health money, um, clearly um, what happened here appeared to be as a result of a deal done between the finance director of NSS and the finance director of Tayside Health Board. Uh, neither of whom were going to gain, as has been said, in a personal basis. It was to try to shore up the appearance of uh, robustness in the Tayside Health Board budget. And it solved the problem for NSS because they didn't then appear with a big surplus at the end of the financial year. Are you sure that similar deals, either in relation to e-health money or in relation to anything, have not been done with similar impacts in terms of covering up what's actually going on in the financial system and the health service <laughs> between NSS and other territorial boards, or indeed between any of the non other non-territorial boards and a territorial board. In other words, I find it, having been a health secretary, difficult to believe in knowing how these bureaucracies work. I find it hard to believe that this is a one-off deal. At this stage, I don't think I can give you that assurance. Um, as you can imagine, the auditor of NSS will be looking closely at the other special purpose funds that it manages and distributes, um, and the auditor of the Scottish Government um, will be looking at the way in which um, the health directorates are looking to improve the allocations process and to understand um, what uh, may have happened under the process as it has stood up until this point. Um, I think it is, though, part of this wider question about the pressure to meet short-term targets rather than to manage long-term sustainability. And what I would like to see is moves um, in the Scottish Government and in individual health boards to shift the focus away from how much do we need to save to hit our revenue limit on the 31st of March to do we understand our finances over the next five years, the next ten years, and what measures are we taking to make sure that they're sustainable. So when that work, when roughly will that work be complete? When will we know as a committee that similar deals, co possibly covering other boards, territorial and non-territorial, possibly covering other issues other than e-health, uh, possibly including other e-health deals, when will we know uh, the results of that work? I know that the NHS Director of Finance is carrying out her own review at the moment um, as a matter of urgency to look at these other um, funding streams and to look at the way in which the allocations process can be tightened. Um, it is an issue that we'll pick up as part of the annual audit for all of the boards that, I, that I'm responsible for for 2017-18 and the audits are due to be completed by the 30th of June. But there's obviously a bit of interplay between those two uh, processes. The, the, there obviously is a very specific issue as to whether similar deals have been yes. done uh, across the board. Yes. Um, and it seems to be it's inevitable that there will be other deals that have been done that have no, so far not come to light. I do not believe, as a former health secretary, this was a one-off deal. And, and as, as I've said, I've reported over a number of years that we, we have seen these late allocations being used for purposes which appear to have um, the primary rationale of, of levelling out underspends and overspends between boards. Yeah. So we, we know it has happened. The question um, which, is now, which now needs to be answered is a slightly more difficult one, which is whether there are any of these sort of hidden streams of funding that are small in relative terms but significant yeah. in absolute terms, um, and uncovering those, I think, may take a little bit longer. Um, but both we as auditors and the NHS Director of Finance are looking at that as a matter of urgency. Okay. Can I um, when you say the auditor of the NSS or the mm. Scottish Government, can you actually say who that is rather than just the auditor? Yes. Um, we, as you know, I appoint the auditors to all of the NHS bodies. In the case of both uh, the Scottish Government, I sign the account myself and I appoint a, a lead um, auditor to undertake the work on my behalf. Um, NSS is also audited by an, an assistant director from uh, Audit Scotland, and in fact it's the same person as the person who leads the Scottish Government audit, so there's a good degree of interaction between. Yeah. yeah. Just go back to NHS Tayside and ask about the interim arrangements. Um, first of all, and let me say I, I have the highest regard for Malcolm Wright. He's one of the best officials I ever came across uh, in government anywhere. So let me say that absolutely. I have total confidence in him as a very, very competent individual. 
But Malcolm is currently Chief Executive of the Northern Region of the National Health Service. He is also currently the Chief Executive of Grampian Region, a Grampian Board, not without its own other difficulties. And now he's been appointed as Acting Chief Executive of Tayside. How on earth is he going to have any time to deal with the problems in Tayside when he's holding down three very important jobs simultaneously? Um, I share your concern, Mr Neil. Um, you all have seen, as I have, the um, information in Paul Gray's letter uh, that um, there are arrangements in place for the Deputy Chief Executive Grampian to take on additional responsibilities in that board to free up some time uh, for Malcolm Wright to focus on NHS Tayside. But none of these are small part-time jobs that leave lots of time and energy for, for other things. Um, I assume that the Scottish Government is uh, looking to resolve the question of the long-term leadership of NHS Tayside quickly, um, and I think that's a question you'd need to address to them. Again, what's the definition of quickly? I, th I think I have real concerns about this. I think this requires somebody who has got no other responsibilities within any other organisation. You know, the chief executive is the key person to sort out. And, you know, we're talking about this is all about governance. This is not a clever governance arrangement, in my view. <coughs> in fact, this is very high risk. I, I share your regard for Malcolm Wright and I share your concerns about the stretch that this is um, placing on any individual, however competent and experienced. Yeah. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, decision, the, the other the interim arrangements, what is the current status of the former chief executive? Uh, my understanding is that Ms McClay is currently off sick. And was she off sick before she was told to stand down? I think these are questions you'd need to direct to the Scottish Government. Um, see, see, my concern is that here, yet again, and we've been through this with the Scottish Police Authority in big time, here yet again we have a Chief Executive who's told to stand down and it would appear then goes sick and getting presumably full salary. And the issue of also severance payment and all the rest of it comes up. So um, from an auditor point of view, and from a governance point of view, um, are you not concerned about this very uh, unclear arrangement? I don't know the timeline um, of uh, actions and um, events uh, surrounding Ms Maclay um, over the last few weeks since these issues have been in the public domain. Um, it's important to say that Fiona, as the appointed auditor, will be looking at any severance payments um, which come up as a result of this in the course of her audit work. Um, at the moment, um, we know that um, the former Director of Finance has departed. She'll be looking closely at the decision-making and any financial transactions around that. Uh, if Ms. Ms. McClay leaves the board, the same will um, be the case. And of course, any auditor would want to comment on um, significant changes and potentially significant gaps in the governance arrangements for the body that they audit uh, without knowing more about the, the particular circumstances and recognising the sensitivity of that employment issue. I don't think there's much more I can say this morning, but it will be an important matter for the auditors. So there's one other related point in relation to the former chief executive, because obviously when she became chief executive, she was then appointed as a director of the board. So has she resigned from or been dismissed as a director of the board because it's two separate processes? Um, my understanding is that she would be a member of the board as the chief executive. I haven't seen anything to suggest that she has been removed as a member of the board. Um, and I think it does come down to um, understanding uh, very explicitly what her status is. My understanding is that she's on sick leave, but it really is a question for um, either the chair of the board or for the Scottish Government. To check the current situation, certainly when I was there, because I, I changed the rules, because the irony was that the Cabinet Secretary had to approve every board member except the appointment of the Chief Executive, over whom at that time the Cabinet Secretary had no responsibility, and I changed it because an appointment was made in one board that I strongly disagreed with. I indicated previously that I strongly disagreed with it. Uh, the board and the chair went ahead anyway, made the appointment, and then they asked me just to sign off this person then becoming a director, and I refused to do so.
uh, until we changed the rules. And we changed the rules so that you know, the Cabinet Secretary, because it's the most important board appointment of all the appointments, and yet it was the one the Cabinet Secretary had absolutely no involvement in. Uh, so we changed the rules so that the Cabinet Secretary had to approve the appointment as Chief Executive, but it was a separate process, legal process, uh, as to making the, the, chief, the appointed Chief Executive a member of the board. I think in all of these points, convener, we need absolute clarification from Paul Gray because I don't want to see us yet again in a position where a Chief Executive is told to stand down because of uh, the governance situation and then, you know, can stay on full, full salary for a year or whatever uh, before they actually leave the organisation. Now, I don't want to get into personal issues. Obviously, I, this is a governance issue, and I'm addressing it as a governance issue. But I think in all of these questions, we need immediate clarification from Paul Gray uh, on all of these questions. We'll be seeking that from Paul Gray, and we can discuss that um, after this evidence session. Thank you, Mr Neil. Can I follow up on one of those questions, uh, Auditor General? This committee well before my time on it, has been concerned for many years about severance payments in the public sector, and Alex Neil touched on this. We know about the financial mismanagement at NHS Tayside. You have reported on it for many years now under Section 22. In your opinion, should the outgoing chief executive receive a severance payment? Um, I think it would be difficult to justify a severance payment in the terms that I think you're intending, convener. Um, but the committee heard in evidence from um, the chair and former chair and chief executive of the board before the Easter recess um, that actually there was no severance payment involved, but instead the former director of finance uh, chose to exercise his option to retire, uh, given his age and standing um, with the board. That is very much the sort of territory that Fiona and Bruce will be exploring as part of their audit work um, to understand the basis on which he left, to understand the basis of any payments that may have been made, um, and you've got my assurance that we'll report that back as part of the reporting on the audit, which is due to complete by the end of June. On the, with respect to on the Director of Finance, we're in a current situation where we have a Chief Executive who we expect will leave the organisation. Or the Cabinet Secretary said her position was untenable and she has been replaced, but is still an employee. Given concerns of public money around these severance payments in the public sector, do you think it would be appropriate for an outgoing Chief Executive to receive a severance payment from the public purse? It's always very difficult to comment on specific cases because there are, there are um, both um, disciplinary um, potential implications to be considered and employment law considerations to be taken into account. What I, ex what, I, what I would expect the board to do and what Fiona will be doing as the auditor is looking at the process the board goes through um, in deciding um, how to give effect to the um, requests that the Cabinet Secretary has made in relation to the Chief Executive. There are clearly questions to answer here. Um, those questions, as far as I know, have not yet been answered, and that would then lead on to a question of whether any severance payment were appropriate and how it were made. What I can do is to bring full transparency to that and to report to you any concerns that I might have about the way in which it's done, as I've done on a number of occasions in the past. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Just to ask a, a few questions that perhaps haven't been asked yet in relation to the, the eHealth £5.3 million. Do, do we know if that money was receipted as a, as a single payment initially, or was it itself received as separate payments initially? Do we know that? Um, it, it certainly wasn't a single payment, and it wasn't, it, and it wasn't a payment for eHealth. It was a, an allocation from the Scottish Government to NHS Tayside, which didn't make clear what it was for or the conditions attached to it. Fiona? And it came in in smaller amounts than five point, it wasn't a single yeah. £5.3 million pounds yeah. transaction. So I think my recollection is that it was split across um, four different transactions for 2016-17. That's not the full 5.3, but... Um, yeah, so, so it, it was split up. It yes. came in in smaller chunks initially. Then it through the allocation letters, yes, it was split. But would it still have been described as the, the same thing, if you, if you know what I mean with the, the terminology, the language, the allocation letters? They would describe it as 
we didn't describe it as anything. I think it's the problem. It simply described it as an allocation right. of funding to NHS Tayside right. rather than describing it as e-health funding. And from Fiona. Yeah, I, think, I think there was e-health <coughs> in, in the description, but there was no indication that it wasn't e-health funding due to Tayside. Um, right. There was no indication that it was due to other boards or that it was due to be repaid. So. But and so from that point, and from that point onwards, there was a further process of splitting it up into even smaller <laughs> units, which, in the, the Mr. Gray's words, was a process intended to obscure the transactions. Did, did that take place, or was it the, the amounts that were received and the small amounts? Was that the small amounts that we are talking about here, or was it further dispersed and spread out through the year so to, the to achieve this effect? That yeah. We're, um, so the allocation that is for sixteen seventeen was split into four transactions, and then that as a whole is included in the total income that is disclosed in in the board's accounts. So it, it, it's not actual money in your hand. It's it was an allocation yes. against which the financial outturn is assessed for uh, measuring whether they've achieved your targets. Or yes, not. I understand that. Yes. But what I'm trying to ask is, if it came in, say, as four payments. Did it then appear in the accounts as ten payments? Was it was it further divided to to bring it under this million pound threshold below which people were unlikely to notice it? No, it's quite the opposite. It goes into the total um, income, which is the the large numbers on the face of the the accounts. So why didn't anybody notice it? I mean, five point three million is a quite a significant amount of money not to notice. It was 2.5 million in 2016-17, um, and that um, was part of um, the overall revenue income of £803.2 million. Um, and as Fiona has said, the allocation letters didn't make it clear that either it wasn't specifically for Tayside or that it was liable to be repaid in the following financial year. Okay, okay. In terms of the audit process, there was some discussion convening about whether the audit process should or shouldn't have picked this up, and there's been some discussion about that. What, what, what do you think yourself here? Do we need a different process? I mean, it's one thing to say to the boards now, stop doing that, but it's another thing, surely, to make sure that it's not being done. If the audit process itself won't find this or reveal this, what is it we need to do to put in place to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen? Is it another? Is it an extra audit process, or is it something else internal that needs to take place? Um, I think um, the the uh, root cause of this is the system by which the Scottish government allocates funding to NHS boards. Um, that is the the prime source of income which they receive. Um, it's important that boards themselves are clear what they're receiving, why, and any conditions attached to it. Um, the uh, events surrounding e-health funding in Tayside have demonstrated shortcomings in that process. Um, that's very clear from the Grant Thornton report. We know that the NHS Director of Finance is reviewing that process and will be looking closely um, as part of our audit of the Scottish Government to look at what changes they make to that um, and to what extent we think they're um, addressing the risks that have been identified here. Okay. Have I time to ask a question on the endowment fund? Uh, briefly, briefly, yeah. Um, Oscar in 2010 looked at Lothian Health Board's endowment fund management and made some recommendations about the separation of duty uh, in terms of the endowment fund boards as opposed to the board. Um, do you think the guidelines or the recommendations made then were strong enough and do we need to review that given what's happened with NHS Tayside? Do you want to answer that? I think back to the earlier point that um, the Auditor General made about the need to review the guidance to see if it is clear enough. It's um, the audit auditors will check against the guidance to make sure that organisations are following the rules. And if it is very difficult, or if there is quite a lot of leeway or a degree of breadth around how they can be um, followed through locally, then that's very difficult for audit teams then to determine. What, what does it look like when it's not falling within those rules? If the breadth is quite is is quite is quite significant and it's not very clear from the guidance, so I think part of the process that's happening now is as a consideration about whether that guidance does need to be clearer, and that will help the audit process in turn. Okay, thank you. Ian Kerr. Very briefly, points of clarification, if I may. First of all, the the e health monies, uh, so 5.3 million. It's broken down into chunks below 1 million. Uh, has anyone reconciled the accounts such that uh, the allocation letters match to what was actually contained in the ledgers? 
that, that's a core part of the work that um, the auditors do in every health board. The allocation letters are um, a, a, the prime source of evidence for the income that the board has to spend, which is obviously a, a foundation of the audit work. The problem isn't that the allocation letters were wrong, it's that they didn't provide that information about um, the money being there for more than just Tayside's use and for it being repayable in the following financial year. Um, so that was that was opaque to everybody apart from the Director of Finance of NHS Tayside and apparently the Director of Finance of NHS National Services Scotland. And then can I just move on something that uh, Willie Coffey asked about? Uh, so obviously we've heard about this deliberate obscuring. Um, we've, we heard that the funds were broken down into pots of less than a million so that uh, the, uh, an average board wouldn't pick them up. But what I just heard from Fiona Mitchell-Knight was that, they, in fact, the sums kind of came in and were collated into a big sum and therefore became much more obvious. Uh, have I misunderstood something there? I think um, what Fiona was um, saying was that, it, let's be clear, in 2016-17 the amount involved was 2.5 million um, as set out in um, the briefing paper that we've provided to mm. you. Um, and I think Fiona was saying that that 2.5 million needs to be seen in the context of the 803 million pounds of the overall revenue coming to the board in that year. Um, the additional uh, amount of money that brings it up to the 5.3 was money that the board was banking on was expecting to receive in 2017-18, um, so hasn't been part, part of the um, overall outturn yet or indeed part of the audit um, which is happening. I think Bruce and Fiona are in a position to give you a bit more information about the, the way in 2016-17 the money was managed. <coughs> yeah, um, um, the, the allocation actually comes into the accounts through the uh, summary of core revenue resource outturn. So that starts off with the, the, net, the net expenditure of the health board mm -hmm. and then set against that is the amount that comes through as the, the gross allocation from the Scottish Government, which then uh, we identify whether they've met their target of, of achieving their revenue resource limit. Uh, that only comes into the accounts in, in a single sum and that's what we then check to the allocation letter from the Scottish Government and it's the resource accounting manual and the Scottish Public Finance Manual that requires us to do that to make sure that those two are in agreement. So at no stage in the accounts does it split it down to any greater detail than that. So there would be no way that we would be able to evidence any of the amounts within that to a, a degree that you, you suggest that we could be looking at. Okay, thank you. I mean, obviously we've been concentrating here on the, the financial impact of these decisions, but the whole point is the e-health money was designed to carry out specific initiatives in relation to e-health, such as developing the electronic patient record and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the important point here that we haven't talked about is, as a result of these deals, is the ministerial policy on e-health being sabotaged in order to reach a deal to cover up a, a real deficit or a bigger deficit than appears to be the case. And what, how, what have been the implications for government policy? I mean, I, one of my frustrations, particularly on e-health when I was a cabinet secretary, I felt as though, you know, without having an army of people to double check things were being delivered, that in a lot of areas it wasn't being delivered to the front end. And it's, it's and now I'm beginning to understand <laughs> some of the reasons why. And I think we need to look at this from also from the point of view of that e-health money was designed to do something, to take forward um, the e-health agenda, and clearly that didn't happen. I think, sorry, Auditor General. I'll be brief, convener. You're absolutely right that that is in many ways the important question. Um, I think it's important to be clear that the reason why the money was available to be transferred to NHS Tayside was because of slippage on the e-health programme. I think it's a stretch to suggest that that's due to any attempt to sabotage um, the programme, but I think it does demonstrate um, the uh, difficulties in spending that money in ways that does achieve the transformation of the health service, which actually would be um, one of the solutions to the financial pressures that Tayside and other health boards are under. Intention sabotage, what I'm saying is the consequence was effectively to sabotage the, pro the programme. It, it's due to slippage, there's no question yeah. of that. And of course we have this bizarre situation where the e-health monies were being used to 
deal with the deficit and then charity endowment money would seem to be used for an e-health project. Um, Auditor General, just on the deferred expenditure, the e-health money, you heard me um, asking the former chief executive at our last evidence session if she should have been asking uh, these questions about deferred expenditure. Ian Gray asked as well. In your opinion, should she been should she have been asking those questions about what the deferred expenditure was and how much it was? I think any chief executive and any board should be asking those questions, particularly in a context where we know a lot of boards rely on deferred income and other short-term measures to hit their targets. Having said that, um, I think it comes back to the point that the Director of Finance holds a very responsible, personally responsible position, has professional and ethical responsibilities, and if the Director of Finance isn't providing uh, straightforward information about those questions, it's difficult to know how the Chief Exec or the Board um, could get beyond that in the absence of um, evidence that there's a particular problem. And we know from the Grant Thornton report that evidence wasn't um, apparent. You do think it is a two-way street, because the evidence we heard would indicate that it, it, it's that absolutely. she was under the impression it was a one-way street. She wasn't given this information and therefore didn't know about it. But in your opinion, it is a two-way street. There's obligations on director finance to provide the information and obligations on the chief executive to ask those questions. Absolutely. It's, right. it's incumbent on any board member, chief executive and other board members, to, to ask the, the difficult and challenging questions. It's what they're there for. Bill Bowman, you've been extremely patient. Thank you, convener. Um, when I ask my questions, I'm asking them of the Auditor General, not at Scotland, if it's a different answer for either, please, please let me know. Are you professionally regulated? Um, yes, um, we are, we're not, we, we voluntarily apply the international standards on auditing um, and um, the audit work that's carried out, whether um, for the audits that I sign off or for the audits that Audit Scotland staff sign off in their own names, um, are subject to all of the requirements of ISQC1 um, and the broader um, requirements that are there. We're not subject um, in a formal sense to review by either the FRC or the reg uh, recognised supervisory bodies, but as of um, the last financial, the last audit year, we have voluntarily um, appointed one of the R RSBs to oversee the audit work to provide me as Auditor General, the Accounts Commission, and the Board of Audit Scotland with assurance about the quality of the audit work. So I would interpret that as you're self-regulating. Um, we're we're not self-regulating in that we have now appointed um, an arm's length. Um, RSB to work independently to carry out the same reviews that they do of other firms and to report that in the same ways. But you've appointed them yourself? Yes. <laughs> so if somebody was dissatisfied with um, your work and if it was a, a commercial audit firm could go to the regulator, can they go to somebody to um, ask them to investigate you? Um, they would come to me and to the board um, and we would provide you with the evidence that we have about the quality of the audit work. Um, as it happens in the first round of the audit work that was carried out, of the audit review that was carried out by the RSB, NHS Tayside was one of the audits and has come out as a uh, 2A grading, which means that only limited improvements are required and it meets all of the, the relevant professional standards. I would still interpret that as being self-regulating. You're not um, statutorily regulated. In a formal sense, yes, but we have, we've done everything we can to make sure that we're meeting the same standards because I have a very strong professional commitment, as you would expect, to the quality of the work that we do. I understand that. Thank you. Um, on the question of the audit of the endowment funds, you distanced yourself from that, but you also said that they are included in the consolidated financial statements. To me, that means you have an audit responsibility over those funds um, regardless of who did the audit. Can you, can you just clarify that you take responsibility for those audits? I, I think it's um, not quite accurate to say that I distance myself from it. As a matter of fact, I don't audit or appoint the auditors to the endowment funds under the charity's regulations. They appoint their own auditors. Um, it's also the case, as I said, that since 2013, the endowment funds have been uh, consolidated within the board accounts and the auditors follow the requirements of ISA 200 in doing that. You may not have the right to get certain information. No, I said we don't have access to um, the same. Uh, we don't have the same degree of access to a, a body or a fund that we don't audit as we do to the ones that we do. But you but must we... judge that's not a limitation in your scope because there's no 
comment on the, in the financial statements. We apply ISA 200 um, and Fiona and Bruce will be very happy to talk you through how they do that in relation to the NHS Tayside Endowment Fund. Okay, thank you. Um, we've, or I've asked questions before, um, I think on the SPA audit and, and, and this, where we have a clean financial statement opinion and then quite damning Section 22 reports. And in the Chamber um, this week, the Cabinet Secretary referred to the financial statements having clean opinions. Is there some misunderstanding then between um, your stakeholders as to the meaning of your, your audit work on the financial statements? Um, I'm not sure there is, although I think there is a misunderstanding in this case. Um, my recollection of the official report is that the Cabinet Secretary said that this hadn't been raised by the external auditor. I think that's incorrect. Um, it clearly was raised by the internal auditor in the annual audit report, which is in the public domain. And that's an important difference between uh, the public audit regime in Scotland and the audit regime in the private sector, um, that uh, public sector auditors have reported in public uh, since the establishment of Audit Scotland. Um, and that report has been available both on the NHS Tayside website and on the Audit Scotland website since the conclusion of the audit. There's a very clear mention of this issue in the annual audit report for 2013-14. Well, an annual audit report, to me, it's the one on the financial no. statements. Um, I have here a copy of the um, report uh, on NHS Tayside for 2013-14. Sorry, I'm talking about the current year. And, and the same will be true for the current year, but in every case the auditor is required under the legislation to report to the members of the board and to me as Auditor General, and that is available in the public domain, and it contains a very clear reference within the executive summary uh, to the uh, retrospective transaction between the endowment fund but, and the NHS But not in the actual finances. financial statements, auditor opinion. Um, the, well, the audit opinion is a short form opinion and certainly was in 1314 about true and fair view and the transaction doesn't affect the true and fair view or regularity. Um, but the uh, wider annual audit report, which is an important part of the public audit regime in Scotland and across the UK, contains a clear mention and it's that which provides the basis for the further reporting that I can do under my personal statutory powers. Okay. Thank you. Just one final point. Very please. briefly. Because I, I just, um, you know, Liam Kerr mentioned about who might know about this. I mean, my experience is that whenever there's a troublesome event, it's never just one person that knows about it. And um, you, you asked about what other, you know, audit processes. To me, it's professional scepticism and what you might call an auditor's nose to know that there's something not right. And maybe can you can you tell us that you had no feeling that something wasn't right in in NHS Tayside? Audits, Audit Scotland yeah. weren't the appointed auditor in 2014. No, I'm oh, I'm sorry. In that case, do please carry on. Um, so um, I think it's already been discussed that we um, have reported extensively on our concerns about the financial sustainability and the financial position of the board. Um, that was in our annual audit report that was then picked up in the Section 22 report. Um, as a result of the issues that have, have been identified recently in terms of the accounts, um, the e-health transaction is, is clearly a misstatement in the accounts, but not of a, a material nature. Um, and I've explained already um, how we were not able to identify that because it was not identified in the, the Scottish um, allocation letters. Um, the endowment fund issue is not an issue for the 16-17 the accounts. The, the, um, the consolidation into the group was um, accounted for appropriately. All very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I'm going to suspend for two minutes for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
I'd like to welcome Caroline Gardner back to the table along with her colleagues from Audit Scotland for item three, managing the implementation of the Scotland Acts. Mark Taylor, I'd like to welcome you, Assistant Director, Michael Oliphant, Senior Audit, Audit Manager and Morag Campsey, Audit Manager. Auditor General, I believe you have a statement. The brief statement, thank you, Convener. The report I'm bringing to the committee today is the fourth in a series of reports examining how the Scottish Government is implementing the new powers arising from the 2012 and 2016 Scotland Acts. My report assesses the progress up to the end of January this year and provides an update since I last reported in March 2017. As the committee knows, the 2012 and 2016 Scotland Acts devolve a range of responsibilities for taxes, borrowing and social security. Implementing these powers is a huge and complex programme of work. About 40% of the Scottish Government's planned spending in 2018-19 is expected to come from Scottish taxation and borrowing, and this will increase to about 50% by 2020. As a result, managing Scotland's public finances is fundamentally changing, and the Scottish budget is becoming increasingly complex, with greater uncertainty and volatility compared to when the budget was relatively fixed through the block grant from the UK Government. The way in which the Scottish economy performs relative to the UK economy um, will have a greater influence on the Scottish Government's choices over tax and spending than ever before. Implementing and managing the new powers alongside the Scottish Government's current responsibilities and responding to the UK's withdrawal from the European Union has significant staffing implications. The Government has been modelling its workforce arrangements and refining its processes for collecting workforce information over the past year to help inform its recruitment plans. This starts the process of workforce planning at all levels of the organisation, but there's lots still to do. It will be difficult for the Government to recruit the staff numbers and skills needed to deliver the powers in time. I'm pleased to report that the Government's Social Security programme has made good early progress. However, a significant amount of work is required this year if planned timescales are to be met. This includes launching a new agency, Social Security Scotland, to deliver the Carers Allowance Supplement in summer 2018, and putting the foundations for the required IT infrastructure in place to del deliver the devolved benefits. This will require effective working with other organisations such as the Department for Work and Pensions. The programme isn't without risk, and I highlight a number of these risks in my report, along with areas to prioritise. Ensuring enough time is built into plans for assurance activities, for procurement, recruitment and succession planning will be key to managing those risks. Finally, the costs of implementing the new powers will be significant. The Government estimates that the Social Security powers alone will cost around £308 million to implement. By the 31st of March this year, the Government had drawn down the full £200 million UK Government contribution towards the cost of the new powers, with the excess to be funded from the wider Scottish budget. There is a need for greater transparency and a better understanding of the overall costs of implementing the new powers to support financial planning. Having a clear picture of how much it is costing to implement the powers of the Scotland Acts and how this is being managed will help the Parliament's scrutiny and decision making in the years ahead. My report also highlights the need for the Scottish Government to finalise and embed the governance and organisational arrangements for the new Scottish Exchequer to oversee the continued implementation of the Scotland Act powers and the management of Scotland's public finances. Convener, as always, will do our best to answer your questions. Thank you, Auditor General. I invite Liam Kerr to open questions for the committee. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> as ever, Auditor General, I'm grateful for the report, which I, I think is very detailed and comes across as fair and balanced, so highlighting the good things, but uh, not afraid to highlight the risks. Uh, and indeed, some of the risks uh, around the IT have been highlighted at, uh, I think it's page 32, uh, in the IT system, and of course this committee has looked extensively at IT systems uh, over the last wee while. Uh, you highlight a number of risks on page 32 uh, with the delivery of the social security IT platform, the third one down being the initial design. Uh, the Scottish Government has sent us a letter, which I presume you've seen, uh, which challenges rather robustly, uh, one of the risks, that particular risk uh, that I've highlighted. What they say is these statements are factually inaccurate. Uh, and my officials discussed the detail of this with Audit Scotland on a number of occasions and requested the inaccuracies be corrected. Unfortunately, they were not. 
I was struck by the robustness of that language, uh, and I would like to hear your thoughts on that, please. Um, you won't be surprised, I guess, to hear that I disagree with um, the description of this as a factual inaccuracy. We take very seriously the need to agree the content of our reports with the people we're reporting on, in this case the Scottish Government, um, specifically, precisely to avoid this committee having to get into arbitrating between my reports and um, the people that we're reporting on so that you have that professional evidence base on which to found your work. Um, we um, engaged well, I think, with Scottish Government colleagues throughout the process. Um, it's correct that the, uh, that issue was raised in clearance, and we were very happy to add uh, to the report what you'll see as the second bullet point in the third column of that risk, which recognises that the new uh, case management system is based on an existing multi-benefit system that delivers complex benefits in other countries, as the Minister for Social Security says. Nonetheless, I concluded in finalising the report that the risk set out on the left-hand side of that column um, still remains. Uh, the government is managing the risks reasonably well at this stage, um, but I think it's factually correct to say that the risk remains. So for the avoidance of doubt, you disagree with that statement uh, in the Minister's letter? Yes, I don't think it's factually inaccurate at all to say that risk <coughs> remains while reflecting the action which the government is taking to mitigate it. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. It's really on the same uh, area, Auditor General. What, what, what is the basis for saying what you've said, though? Has there been some kind of technical assessment <coughs> carried out to enable you to come to that conclusion? Um, as you know, we've reported on IT systems extensively over the last few years, and I think we've built up our expertise and experience in doing it. Um, I'll ask Morag, who's been involved in a lot of that work, to talk you through the evidence base uh, for the conclusion that I've drawn there. So, um, as the Auditor General was saying, what we're trying to do in here is, is just highlight some of the risks. And as we have set out, the um, the, uh, the way that the Scottish Government has, has chosen to, to, to create this platform is to do it on a component basis. And, and that's shown in, we've tried to sort of um, summarise that in ex Exhibit 8. Um, I think with the case management system that they, are, um, they have procured to deliver the first wave of benefits, um, they have procured a, a system, an existing multi-benefit system that does deliver um, benefits elsewhere. However, it will obviously have to be developed to meet the, the needs of, of whatever um, the, the, the system that the, um, the Scottish Government chooses in terms of the types of, of benefits and, and the rules around that. So we feel that it's, it's still a risk, and it is still, I should say, at an early stage, the um, particular contract um, has, was just um, issued in November, so the first series of sprints was only um, just taking place in January and February, just as we were finalising the report. So at this early stage, we're just highlight highlighting that as, a, as a, something that um, needs to be kept an eye on. Like I say, the, the fact that it is already used in other countries helps to... Um, to some extent, but because it's at an early stage and, it, and it's, um, it still needs further development, that's why we're highlighting it. Yeah, but is, you, is your comment that the, the CMS that we're talking about, the, uh, being able to support the wave one benefits, you're saying from your technical assessment that you consider that it cannot support post wave one developments without procuring more another piece of software. I think that's the issue that's at stake here. Whereas the Minister is saying quite clearly that it will do. What, well, as we've set out, the, 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 the system does already in other countries um, deliver some complex benefits because the, the later benefits, the, the disability benefits are quite complex. Um, and some of the, until the bill passes and decisions are made around some of the, the rules and, and, and assessments around that, they'll obviously then need to, to, to build the system around that. The initial contract is just for the Wave 1, which are less complex um, benefits. So um, in our view, there will still be some, uh, you know, quite a lot of work to do in, in any further contracts to kind of develop that particular system further. Have, have you actually seen the software? 
Um, we, we've not seen this as software. As I've said, um, the first few sprints were just taking place in January and February, um, which is when we were finalising the contract. So we hadn't undertaken any work on that particular area at the time. I should also say that obviously the um, the procurement process and also um, you know the system there there are assurance frameworks in place that that, that you'll be aware of through the, the Scottish Government in um, technical assurance as well. So um, the, the the tender itself had gone through that technical assessment and was given the, the, the green to go mm -hmm. um, to the next stage. Have you spoken to IBM, who are the contractor, and no. what their view of this is? Because it's clearly a requirement of them to deliver this in such a manner. Have you spoken to IBM? That didn't form part of part of this um, audit. As I said, it's, it, it's at an early stage. Um, the contract was just awarded uh, as we were going through that process, so um, we we didn't undertake that. That might be something that we consider doing um, as we continue to look at this area in the future. Mr. Coffey, Mark Taylor wishes to add some evidence. Oh, sorry, I never saw you, Mark. Yeah. That thanks, convener. Just add a little to that. Yeah. Uh, exhibit 9, the purpose of Exhibit 9, I think it's probably helpful to clarify that a little bit. Yeah. Exhibit 9 is not a list of things that have gone wrong. I would characterise that as a list of things that the government need to get right. As Morag says, the system's not been built yet. We're not in a position to undertake a technical assessment, assessment of it. But from our perspective and our experience of working in similar systems, this is something the government really needs to get right so that as the system is built, that it has the ability to have the other components plugged into it. And that's the risk that we're looking to flag at this stage. As the Auditor General said, our judgment is that it's a live risk. It's something the government is alert to, uh, given the Cabinet Secretary's response and something that is managing. And we flag it for the committee's purpose and the wider purpose of Parliament to be, be aware of that's one of the issues that needs to be managed managed through and worked through. I understand, I understand that, but to, to say the CMS may only be able to process wave one benefits when the government and perhaps the contractor, if we ask them, would say the exact opposite is, is, a, is a fundamental difference here in the report. I've never looked at a picked up a, a, a matter in Audit Scotland's reports in the years I've been at this committee that says something that's a polar opposite of what the government's saying and perhaps the contractor's going to say to us about this. I think the other um, bit of evidence that I play in, Mr Coffey, comes from Exhibit 5, which breaks down for you in a bit more detail the Wave 1 benefits and the post-Wave 1 benefits, as the government describes them. And it's very clear from that that in terms of uh, complexity, the number of people affected, the amounts of money involved, they're very different things. Wave 1 is um, very small compared to the post-Wave 1 benefits, um, and that plays into to our judgment as well. Um, I'd echo strongly what Mark has said. We're not saying this is something that has gone wrong. We're saying it's something that the government needs to, to stay on top of, given the real importance of a smooth delivery of these benefits to the people who rely on them, who are some of the most vulnerable in Scotland. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course, of course, of course. But the, the, there isn't a technical assessment that you've carried out and you haven't spoken to IBM and you haven't seen the software. So how can you conclude that this is a possibility when you're being told the opposite, that it won't, that isn't the case? Our judgment was that that's inherent in the way in which the uh, the system has been pieced together. Okay. That clearly, where there's one component that that is a small but an important part and a platform on which everything else is built, that that component needs to be uh, designed and built in a way that allows those other components to be plugged in. That's the point that we're making, okay. and that from our perspective, that's a significant thing that the government needs to get right going forward. Okay. Okay. Uh, overall, uh, is from from memory, uh, I remember that. Almost half or more than half the cost of the transitions for the social security system is down to the IT systems. How, how are we in terms of monitoring that cost estimate for the delivery of the programme? I don't see a, a, a general overview about that overall cost estimate. How? So uh, exhibit, se uh, exhibit 7 in, in page 26 uh, sets out the breakdown of the figure in the financial memorandum to the bill of IT costs of £190 million. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the contract that we're talking at, about is on the order of £8 million of that full yeah. package. So it gives you a sense of how, uh, um, although it's a core part, how much extra has to be built onto that. We make some comments in the report about the uh, the nature of the costing of the IT system and the stage that that's at. There's a lot still to be built. There's a lot still to be decided. And as those decisions are made, we would expect, and we say this in the report, we would expect greater clarity over this pre and precision over the amount of IT mm -hmm. costs. And that's something we'll be alert to and continue to monitor as we go forward. At the moment, is it on track at the moment, as far as we can tell? 
and Morag may want to ask ask to this, but but and we've made comments elsewhere add, uh, elsewhere in the, the document about the uh, the visibility over the overall cost uh, of, of much of this work and the refinement of that. I think the the, the money that's been committed at the moment is within the budgets that are available. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, I guess one of the biggest concerns about this is really people staffing it, because there's something like 1,500 staff needed. Now, I understand, according to your, uh, your uh, report here, that a fair number of them have come from other parts of the Scottish Government. And in paragraph 19, you do make comment that this has placed pressure on other directorates' ability to deliver business-as-usual activities. And you quote other new powers and the plan for the impact of the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Can you quantify that in any way? I mean, is, is that just a, an assumption, or is it based on uh, something you've seen? I'll ask Michael to come in, a, in at a moment, in a moment. But I think, first of all, um, there is a, a straightforward um, sense coming from our engagement with government as their auditors that people are under pressure. Um, there's business as usual, which is demanding in itself. Um, there is the new financial powers coming through and the preparations for um, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, whatever that may mean for Scotland. And clearly that's a very live question at the moment. We're conscious from our engagement that people are under pressure. And we also know that people being transferred from um, other parts of the organisation into the social security team is having an impact on, on those pressures elsewhere. Michael, do you want to put a bit more flesh on the bones of that? Sure, yeah, and I think as we point out in the, the report that the Scottish Government has taken some important steps in identifying its workforce requirements, uh, particularly over the, the last year. Um, what we would like to see is for them to extend that over five years, and they've started in plans to do so. Um, a lot of this comes down to the movement from generalist skills to more specialist skills, particularly in things like long-term financial planning, financial modelling, uh, economic forecasting, and as we've touched on already, IT and, and digital skills, and an element of that is, a, is around the need for cyber security specialists. Um, so a lot of that is uh, its current needs, but what we're keen for the Scottish Government to do is to map out the longer term needs um, and factoring in things that are unknown at the moment um, as best as they can. And you, you mentioned that the UK's planned withdrawal from the European Union has been one of them. If we, if we look at, I mean, we've talked about IT skill shortages quite a number of times in the past in this committee, and again, Willie Coffey raised that today. Um, but you're talking about a wider spread of skill shortages. Is there a shortage in the market of, of skills other than the IT skills, which you've, we're already well aware of? Are there, are there other shortages in the market? Uh, I, th I think it's fair to say, yes, there is. And I think that's part of the, the challenge that is facing the Scottish Government is that they're not just um, uh, dealing with looking to get numbers in, it's actually the availability of, of um, th these required skills within the market. They're, they're trying to keep compete externally as well. Um, and that's also a risk that the, the Scottish Government uh, needs to manage in relation to uh, retaining the staff that it does have, that it doesn't lose them to um, external um, providers, whether it's in relation to IT or, or finance. So that's why they've undertaken some work to develop its, its talent management programme with a view to try and retain the, the, the key skills that they've got, as well as looking for additional support. I suppose it would be far too simplistic to say that if a body of work is taken from one area of the civil service to another, that some of the skills would follow with it because there would be less work in the remaining part of that body, if that makes sense. Are you referring to um, skills within DWP? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I think in principle that's probably right. In practice, that the... the um, the scale of DWP's activity, which is transferring, is very small relative to their overall work, whereas it's very significant compared to a Scottish government that hasn't had to do this before. Um, so I think it's unlikely that there will be surplus people in DWP on any significant scale to help fill the gap. I know it's one of the things that the team have been looking at. Michael, do you want to add to that? Uh, not much more to add than to that. that one of the but one of the key things is the, the transfer of knowledge where uh, a member of staff does leave a directorate to, to move into another one. 
one of the key things that um, we've we've flagged the Scottish Government in our discussions on this specific topic, and one that they're keen for them to include within this longer-term workforce planning is where people do move from one part of the government to the other, that they do um, ensure that there's this transfer of knowledge takes place. Um, that's particularly important also where they're using short-term contractors or people coming in secondment, that um, while that might provide a short-term fix in terms of the skills, it's important that as part of their work um, in the government that they're able to pass on that knowledge and expertise to others. Are you satisfied that, that there's fairly robust processes in place for that to happen? So I think I think it's um, it's improving in terms of the work that they've done, the analysis they've done over 2017. But I think um, more needs to be done in relation to that to identify the uh, numbers of people that are required, the the types of roles that are required, um, and uh, certainly the the skills that are required over the longer term. I mean, I'm pleased to hear that the Scottish government's got put in place a good workforce plan. Um, that's certainly the first step. But recruitment, do they have a robust recruitment process? And I realise you're limited by what's available in the market, but is it, is it constructed in such a way that it's going to get the best out of the market? I think it's possibly too early for us to say because a lot of the substantial recruitment in terms of the numbers you mentioned, the, the, the 1,500 for the Social mm -hmm. Security Agency, that's still to take place. Um, but certainly that is the, the, one of the biggest challenges facing the, the Scottish Government, particularly in relation to Social Security, is it's not just the skills but actually the, the numbers that they, they need in place, um, particularly with the, the external competition that they're, they're facing as well. I mean, clearly all the 1,500 are not going to be highly skilled IT experts or financial experts. A lot of them will be counter staff and so on who are dealing with the, with the uh, people. Um, do you think that there's more the Scottish Government could do in that regard, or are they doing all that they can, given the limitations of the market? I think, as we say in the report, they've made some important um, early steps in relation to that, um, in terms of identifying the immediate need. Um, they've taken some steps to uh, integrate their uh, workforce um, uh, re requirements in terms of the recruitment processes. But previously, this used to be done in isolation. You know, each directorate would would identify their own recruitment needs and and take forward recruitment campaigns on their own. But there's there's, there's a better process that is is, is now in place to uh, coordinate and integrate the the workforce um, uh, planning requirements and therefore the recruitment strategies that will come out of that. I think it's just too early to say whether that will be effective or not. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Uh, I want to. You mentioned at the outset about the 200 million, the, the budget and the drawdown. Uh, now, to put this in context, the key message for under the fiscal framework, the UK government will contribute 200 million to the costs of implementing the new powers. The Scottish government will have drawn down all of this by 31st of March 2018. So we'll assume that they have done. The Scottish Government has not estimated the total overall cost of implementation. Now, that, just as a statement, rather concerns me. Um, but let me ask, in March 2017, I think you raised exactly the same point. Uh, or I think I'm right in saying, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that you raised exactly this in, in your report and said the Scottish Government really ought to be working out how much money it's going to need to do this. Is it true that nothing has apparently been done in that regard? And if so, doesn't that concern you? Um, I think the first thing to say is that the 200 million is the sum that was agreed within the fiscal framework as being the UK government's contribution to Scotland's um, implementation costs. Um, it was never intended to be um, an estimate of the costs of doing it. It was negotiated and agreed between the two governments. Um, and, be, and beyond that, for that very reason, I think it's important that the government does both develop its own estimates and make those more transparently available to parliaments and others with an interest to support parliament's decision making around things like the Social Security Bill, um, proposals around the new tax powers and so on. I don't think it's fair to say that nothing has been done, but I think it's becoming increasingly urgent that that um, completeness and transparency are taken forward. And I'll ask Mark to, to tell you a bit more about what we've seen over the last year. 
I, I think to, to pick up on the premise of the, of the question, Mr. Kerr, we, we made we made the recommendation last year. Uh, we uh, emphasise in this report that that yet has yet been yet to be done. Uh, and we think it's really important that it is done, so that there's a sense to Parliament and to the public at large how much the package of new powers is going to cost. There is some information around that. There's the estimate of the 308 million around Social Security that we talked about, and we were able to pull together some figures uh, uh, for the report, which you'll see in uh, Exhibit uh, Number Three from memory, uh, Exhibit Four. Uh, uh, from various sources, and those sources were available in the public domain. But our essential point is that there's no overall assessment done by the government. And to, to illustrate the point, we had to work quite hard to pull together the numbers in Exhibit 4 from lots of different places. Our point is there needs to be a greater clarity about what's the total expected cost. Yes, that cost needs to be refined as, as decisions are made and, and, and things go on, but we think it's important that Parliament's clear what figure uh, the government's working to. Mm -hmm. uh, you then go on in the, in the report to say that the excess, so this is the bit over the 200 million contribution, and there will be a, a bit. You mentioned a 308 million Social Security, for example. Uh, so any excess will need to be funded from the wider Scottish budget. Can you put that in context for me? Uh, that is presumably cash that otherwise could or perhaps should be spent on other spending commitments by the Scottish Government. Is that correct? It's just going to have to be pulled from somewhere and spent somewhere. So, so as the Auditor-General explained, the £200 million is a contribution from the UK Government that's been agreed through a political process. I think the expectation was always that the package of powers will cost more than that, and therefore, by definition, the, the remainder, the balance, needs to be funded from amongst the Scottish Budget, and that's a choice that the Scottish Government and Parliament makes about how it allocates its budget in, in, order, uh, in order to achieve those aims and how much uh, it allocates to do that. It was always expected that was the case. Our point is there needs to be greater clarity on the extent to which that is likely to be the case, and we also make some specific points about how that uh, is treated in the budget so that there's greater clarity for Parliament about the money that's been allocated and the timetable for that. The, the, the lack of clarity in planning just really does give me cause for concern. I, I want to take you back to, you mentioned, Mark Taylor, the uh, 308 million on the Social Security, uh, and at paragraph 30, you say, at the time of publishing its 2017-18 draft budget, the Scottish Government had not prepared detailed spending estimates for the Social Security programme. So where, where is £308 million coming from? Uh, I mean, is this a finger-in-the-air thing, or how accurate is £308 million? So, so the £308 million is the initial assessment in, from the financial memorandum that goes with the Social Security bill. And uh, the, the, the government's given evidence elsewhere on the makeup of that, uh, and inevitably that includes a fair number of estimates for, uh, and, and assumptions about some decisions that have yet to be made and what the financial consequences of those decisions are. It's the government's current estimate. Uh, within our report, we describe uh, and, uh, how the government needs to continue to refine that estimate and refine that figure as it takes decisions uh, 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 in the future. And uh, one of the big parts of that that we touched on earlier is the IT element of the cost uh, and the extent to which there is uh, a fair amount built into that estimate for uncertainties. Uh, 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 optimism bias is the technical phrase, a fair amount built into that. And we are clear in the report the need for the government to, as it makes decisions, to be able to bring that figure down and, and provide more certainty over the expected level of costs in that area. So just finally then, do you get any sense, it, if we start from a position that says you recommended similar things in March 2017 uh, as to what is being recommended now, do you get any sense that the uh, this next year will be different and will produce a different report this time next year. So we're always optimistic, uh, and, and the basis for that optimism this time out is in discussion with the government. Uh, we uh, understand that in their uh, current uh, the, uh, report that will prepare over the next month, which is the Section 33 report in progress, they intend to give more indication of the overall cost in that report, and we would uh, welcome that if that was to happen. I'm grateful. Thank you. Ian Gray. Different topic. Is that OK? Yes. It's not a follow-up. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the new borrowing and reserves powers. Um, at paragraph 130 um, in the report, Auditor-General, there's a paragraph which 
I confess I don't entirely understand. I wonder if you could clarify it. It says that um, the Scottish Government have not agreed the overall principles and policies for borrowing uh, and use of reserves, uh, but these powers are now available. Um, so it's not, it's not clear to me from the subsequent paragraphs whether that means they are not able to use those powers yet or whether they're using them under some kind of temporary ag agreement with Treasury. Can I refer you to Exhibit 1, which sets out the timeline for the new financial powers? That's on page 8 of the report. Um, and you'll see there um, in the 2017 block um, the increased borrowing reserve powers setting out both the overall limit and the annual limit. Those powers are now in effect um, and the government has access to uh, the overall limits subject to the annual limits for both uh, borrowing and uh, moving money in and out of the reserves. The point that I was um, trying to make and clearly not doing very clearly in paragraph 130 is that it would be um, a real contribution to financial transparency and to Parliament's decision-making if government were to publish the principles that it plans to apply in using the, the borrowing powers. Um, to what extent does it intend to draw them down to invest in uh, capital infrastructure? To what extent does it intend to hold back some allowance in either the borrowing powers or the reserves to allow for the unexpected that may come out over um, the foreseeable medium-term future um, and just the, uh, the policy decision it needs to make about the way that those things will be used rather than um, providing Parliament with uh, proposals for decision in isolation each time. Okay, uh, uh, the, I think the next paragraph, 131, refers to a memorandum of understanding that's expected at the end of March, which is now passed. I just wonder if that did materialise. What do you know? I'm afraid we have no, no, no immediate information on that, but it's certainly something we can get back to the committee on. Thanks. Well, the coffee. I wonder if I could just go back to the software for a moment, uh, please, uh, Auditor General. In paragraph 76 there, you alert us to the potential risk uh, in our dependency in the DWP to modify their systems so that we can make them fully compatible with ours. Um, is there any agreement that you know of in place in the project for the DWP to to agree to modify on time or whatever. It seems to me that that particular aspect is one where we have no control whatsoever in the ultimate delivery of this, this system, unless it's by agreement written into the contract, perhaps. Do, could you tell us a wee bit more about that? We, we conclude in the report, um, and it's part of the key messages on page 10, that the Scottish Government has effective working relationships at official level with the UK bodies involved, and that's primarily DWP and HMRC. Um, I'll ask Mark, I think, to talk a little bit more about what we see in detail around that. Yeah, thank you, Auditor General. The, 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 the complexity of this programme means that there are a whole range of discussions around a whole range of systems and interfaces uh, along... Uh, uh, across the range of activities that are set out in Exhibit 5, and, and those are at different stages. Uh, we say in the report, and we have evidence that at official level, those, the DWP and the Scottish Government are working well together on those. And we also set out in the report some of the governance arrangements, both at official level and ministerial level, uh, through which those discussions take place. As a result of that, there is a degree of shared project planning, uh, and there's a degree of project planning, which is Scottish Government project planning. The risk there is to make sure that those th two things uh, uh, are coordinated and uh, work together. And, <coughs> and we also, uh, uh, the paragraph you've picked up, are quite clear that this is a fundamental uh, part of making sure that things progress on time. It's important, th I think, for the Scottish Government to manage its relationship with the DWP, and it's important that, continues that both parties continue to work well together if the whole package of change is going to be delivered on the timetable it's set out. Mm. If, if everyone's working well together, why do you say there is a risk that the Scottish Government requirements are not given enough attention due to the DWP's other priorities? Why would you say that if everybody's working well together and getting on fine? Has there been a contractual agreement in place to deliver this for us? Or, or is it a, a getting on fine arrangement? What so, is it? so the, 
the, the, the projects are at an early stage. What we can point to is the things that have been delivered and the agreements, individual agreements between the DWP and Scottish Government in relation to things like uh, un Scottish Universal Credit Choices, for example, and, uh, and agreements are being put in place around some of those areas, other areas around the Wave 1 benefits and their particular arrangements and agreements that have been put, put in place there. The reason for flagging this up is, again, at an early stage on this, this, this project, to be clear, from our perspective, this is an absolutely fundamental thing that needs to be that the government needs to get right and that both parties have a part to play in that. We have no direct visibility, of course, over the operations of the DWP, and we've talked at a previous session about audit arrangements and some of the limitations in those. Uh, where we sit at the moment, there are no uh, immediate signs of concern, but this is an inherent risk in the way in which this project needs to go forward mm -hmm. that absolutely Scottish Government and absolutely DWP need to pay attention to. But just to be, think, to be clear, that there is no contractual obligation in the part of the DWP to deliver what's required on time for this project. I think it's worth being clear that in contrast to the arrangements for um, the devolution of income tax, where the Scottish Government is required to, to collect and administer that through um, HMRC, the Scottish Government has chosen to deliver its social security powers with the Department for Work and Pensions. So that changes slightly um, the dynamics, the set of things that need to happen. Um, as Mark said, um, the evidence we have suggests that so far that's working well and there is a long way still to come and it will depend on good joint working from both parties here in Scotland and in the DWP itself. Okay. Thank you. Auditor General, half of the 1,500 jobs have been promised by the Scottish Government to... Dundee and the um, the first wave of benefits have to be uh, administrated and, and given next summer. But we're in a situation where the Scottish Government still hasn't identified premises for the new agency uh, in our city. Um, I understand that the Minister might be making an announcement on that next week, but are you concerned that this is, this is kind of indicative of where the Scottish Government are in their planning process, that to this date they still haven't identified a prem premises from which this uh, operation is going to work? I think probably the overall message of the report in relation to Social Security is that the early progress that's been made is good, but that 2018 is absolutely critical in terms of establishing the Social Security Agency and being able to deliver that first wave of benefits next summer. Um, we've talked about the range of things that need to happen for, for that to um, be achieved successfully. Um, it is premises, it is staffing, it is the IT system. Um, and although the early progress is good, there's a huge amount to be done over the remainder of this calendar year to make that happen in practice. You have expected something as fundamental as where they're going to operate from to, be, to have been identified by now. Um, I think uh, the, the question is less um, whether that particular um, announcement or decision should have been made by this stage, um, but the overall um, ambition of looking to deliver the first wave of benefits by the summer of 2019. Um, we think it's achievable, but as we say in the report, we think it will be challenging to get all of those things in place. Mm -hmm. With that time scale, naturally decisions are going to be announced in relatively short order, um, but there's no room for delay and no room for slippage in doing that. Okay. It's my understanding that nearly 600 people applied for the first uh, 80 jobs that were advertised, so there's certainly a lot of uh, interest in, in the community uh, for these jobs. I'd like to thank you all for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of the Audit Committee and move into private session.